while with Corbin Church here. Just a little couple things about him. So Corbin Church has been involved with entrepreneurship for quite a while. He's bought, well, he can buy he what he did. He started and sold seven different businesses throughout his, throughout his time. He kind of got started at the end you know, age of 13. He's franchising stuff like that. about some of these businesses that he's run. He just, uh, just recently exited uh, Gucci Bags, which um, is doing over $70 million in sales every year. So we're really excited to have him with us. And we're going to welcome him to our group. Everybody in here want to be an entrepreneur? Is that what you're supposed to say? Or do you really want to be entrepreneurs? OK, at least some of you. I'm going to be speaking to those of you tonight that want to be entrepreneurs. And to some of you, I might just spark a little interest to become an entrepreneur. Okay? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Raise your hand. Tell me why you want to be an entrepreneur. You just failed. If you want to be an entrepreneur, the first thing you have to do is you have to be assertive. Okay? You cannot be sitting back there. There is a great, great quote that I love. One of my salespeople sent this to me once. And I don't have it memorized. I'm not going to say it exactly the way it's supposed to be said, but it goes something like this. You are either going to work for yourself creating your own wealth, or you're going to work for somebody else creating their wealth. Okay? Now that's worded real pretty somewhere else online. You can find it. But it's a good quote, isn't it? You're either going to work for somebody else and make them their wealth, or you're going to do it for yourself. You have to be assertive. Because it's that person that's been assertive, and that's why he has a company. So when I ask you a question, you've got to say, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready to play this game. I'm in here. I'm here tonight, and I am ready to play. Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Yes, sir. Make money. Make, ooh, he's honest. Most people lie. I like that. <laughs> yes, sir. Freedom. Excellent. OK? OK, make what you're worth. I really like that answer. Yes, sir. I like you. That's a good answer. Good one. Yes, sir. Last one. OK. Good. OK, you know what the realities of entrepreneurism is? You are going to work more hours and more days than anybody else. OK? You want to know the other reality? You're going to make less money than everybody else. OK? Now, I'm not trying to steer you away from entrepreneurialism. That's what it's all about in my mind. I have signed every I have ever received. Okay? I've never worked. I've worked for companies after they bought one of my companies because of golden handcuffs, but I've never gone out and had a job. So I'm a strong believer in entrepreneurialism. It's all I know. But the reality is, I worked a lot of hours. And I didn't always make a lot of money for the amount of hours I was working. So anybody have a marker, whiteboard marker? Business goes like this, right? Thanks. That is super prepared. <laughs> He's on the front row. That dude has some serious points. OK, so the reality is business goes like this. OK, if you're an employee, there are sometimes some layoffs and some cutbacks and so forth. But for the most part, your income stays the same. Maybe you start to get some raises and so forth. The owner of the company, he has his 100K months. And he has his minus 50K months. OK? Smart business. We could also take these zeros off to make this more real. <laughs> Here's the reality. When you have your 10K month, do you go out and buy the Porsche? You bloody better not. <laughs> you better take a whole bunch of that and save it for your minus 5K month. Okay? I'm not here to teach you all the things you get in your classes, and you're going to hear some really unorthodox things from me today. One of the most important things I can share with you, save, save, save. Because 
The person with money is the person that can capitalize on an opportunity. You will be sitting at Thanksgiving dinner and somebody, one of your silly brothers or sisters will be there and they will be talking about this guy who's making all this money doing this crazy something somewhere. But because you're entrepreneurial minded, you'll sit there and say, hmm, nobody's doing that in Logan. And a light bulb will go on for you and you'll say, I can do that in Logan. But you know what? If you don't have any money, it doesn't matter. That will be an opportunity that passes you by. Scrimp, save, do everything you can to put money in the bank and not spend. If you love clothes, jewelry, whatever else you spend your money on, you better find a new love. Okay? Save your money. It is so important. So I sit down with a lot of people just like yourselves. They come up with great ideas. In the past three or four weeks, I've probably met with no fewer than eight people telling me about a new product or a new company that they, needed me to, that they wanted me to invest in. The reason that I share this with you is when somebody, you come and sit down with me, you want me to invest in your product. First of all, it has to be a consumer goods. Everything I'm going to talk to you today about is a consumer good. So all of the formulas, anything I share with you, it pertains to consumer goods. That's my area of expertise. Within consumer goods, I'm all over the place, literally. Okay? I've been in weight loss, exercise, um, handbags, skincare, overnight shipping, everywhere. But it's all pretty much in consumer goods. The, one, the last one was a service, but all the rest were consumer goods. So the key here is that it was all about the opportunity and when it came and being able to do that. So when you come to me and you sit down with me and you want me to invest in your product or your idea or your company, how much money you got? How much money? Who saved? Who has savings? One? How much you saved? About 2,000 bucks. Okay, what's he going to get started with 2,000 bucks? A snow shack. No, I'm just joking. But the reality is is if he comes to me and he pitches me his idea, you know what I'm going to be looking for from him? He needs 250 grand to start his business. You know what I'm willing to put in? 248. Because he's going to put everything he has into it. You're going to need to grow that too up a little bit higher. Okay? <laughs> but if you got 10 grand, he, he can walk away from 2 grand and he's going to be just fine. But a young person, walking away from 10 or 15 or 20. That's a gargantuan sum of money. Would you love to have 15, 20 grand right now? Yeah, so if he had it, it would hurt him to walk away from it. That's, what I, that's when I partner with you and we go into a project together. I need to know that you're willing to put everything on the line. When you're willing to put everything on the line, I'm willing to play with you. If you don't have anything, you're in trouble. Okay? Savings. That is one super important thing that I tell young people as I go around and I work at campuses and so forth. You've got to have savings. I'll tell you a little history. I went to BYU. Um, wow. No naughty comments? <laughs> no, nothing being thrown at me? I went to BYU. Um, I got about a year and a half under my belt and I... <clears throat> Can we turn the cameras off for just a minute? We don't want this recorded. <laughs> I used my student loans to start my first business. <laughs> You're not like from administration or anything, right? <laughs> I, that, I'm not, now that was not a takeaway today. <laughs> that was not a takeaway. I uh, took my $6,000 student loans and I started a window and door company in Salt Lake City. They paid back my student loans really quickly. Um, but I also had a pretty good amount of savings, pretty good amount, uh, maybe six, seven, eight grand, and I started my first company. Now, I needed about $200 a month to live on. My wife and I managed two apartment complexes. We drove a Honda Accord that we bought for $2,000 cash, and we drove to work back and forth every day. She worked as an administrative assistant at St. Mark's Hospital, 
while I started the window business, and as soon as I got busy enough, she came over and started helping me there and quit at the hospital. But for about four years, and we looked like we were 12 years old when we were 21, so for people to hand us a $50,000 check was very, very brave people. But we started this business. There were custom windows and doors. And we built it up to be a very substantial business. Now, very substantial. Later in the 90s, we were taking home about $10,000 a month. Now, if you were to average all of the months from when I started to when I ended, I probably made a whopping 2,000 bucks a month for eight years. Okay? The reality is that's entrepreneurialism. But that was a launch pad. I saved money like nothing other. One of the big things I did was invest in real estate. It's a bit of a tangent, but just quickly. My father said this to me, and it was one of the best lessons I ever heard. My dad said to me, Court, my dad was a furniture salesman. He represented the factories and sold their furniture to the RC Willie types. Okay? And he and this right here is so true of furniture sales. When economic times are bad, nobody buys furniture. It's really tough. But when it's good, it's good. So we had great months. I remember 1976 was a really good year. We moved into a new home. We got a new boat. And my dad bought a little Mercedes. I was only seven years old. But all those things happened in 1976, so it was a good furniture year. Okay? My point is this. I forgot what my point was. <laughs> Real estate, thanks. If you guys will just keep me on track, this is the perfect partnership. <laughs> I love it. <clears throat> so my dad said, Corbin, the way I get through these times is I've taken my money and I invested in real estate. He had a few rental properties that would produce him enough income to live on whether he brought in his income from furniture sales or not. He said, when your mom and I bought our first building, it took everything we had to invest that money in that building. And it scared us to death. Today, that building brings in $6,700 a month, and we could live on that if we had to. I took my dad's advice, and I bought real estate all along the way. I bought all of his real estate along the way as well. And because I would buy from him, parents give flexible payment plans. So, <laughs> so I did that. And that was a principle that has worked really well. That is a time-tested principle. Rental income has worked since the beginning of time and continues to be effective today. Okay? Scrimp, save. When you have some extra to invest, put it in real estate. Live in a duplex, live in one side, rent the other side. That's a great first home. Things like that. My wife and I have moved literally 17 times. When we were young, you don't have any possessions, you don't have any children, keep moving. I think you can move your, your gains forward on your real estate with no taxes, as long as you go bigger. That was the rule back then. I don't know what it is now. I haven't moved for a long time. That's free income, and you just keep growing with it. Okay. All right, so um, while I was doing the window company, I would save money. I'd buy some real estate. I also saved money. I'm a big saver. So that principle that I told you early on, it will do you well if you listen to it and you heed it. I'm going along, I'm at Thanksgiving dinner one day, and a family member starts talking about this weight loss product that's absolutely going crazy. All these people are making all this money. And I just sat there and listened. And the next morning, perhaps Monday morning, I can't remember, it's 1997, I had one of my employees at my window company get on the telephone and start calling every single mall in the country asking if they had a Metabolife cart. Seven days later, I had 17 carts from Ohio to Washington, one in Cache Valley, the Cache Valley Mall. Those carts produced so much money, it was silly. A brain dead person could have run that business. You haven't learned one thing at Utah State that would have helped you be more successful. <laughs> it was simply a craze that was really good. But you know what the difference between success and failure was? I had the savings to go tackle it the next morning. And I was aggressive enough, and I went and made it happen. I was willing to go anywhere. There were multiple months where one single cart produced 
quarter of a million dollars in a single month. One employee, my overhead was like, I don't know, $100. Cost of goods were one-eighth of that. It was silly money. But this is what I'm talking about. Opportunities pass by you all the time. If you're entrepreneurial minded, your radar goes up and says, there's an opportunity. I'm going to tell you about a handbag in a minute because it's a really cool opportunity. But for that, a gentleman had heard about uh, some of my success. I did an overnight shipping thing and so forth and <clears throat> had some great success there. And this guy calls me one day and he says, I've got a product for you to look at. I said, OK, what is it? He said, it's an anti-acne treatment system. OK, tell me more. He says, well, there are five causes of acne. And if you look at everything on the market, it's benzoyl peroxide. Back then, I'm, I'm really old, but it's Clearasil, OK? And it had benzoyl peroxide in it. And that's how you tackled acne, was Stridex pads and, and benzo and with benzoyl peroxide in it. He said, the best way to fight acne is to go after all five causes. If you tackle all five of the causes, you're going to have a much more effective method, or you're going to have better results. I sit down with him. He goes through all the science. It goes right over the top of my head. I'm like, whoa, and I'm, OK, this is great. Thanks. See ya. He calls me a day or two later, and he says, you're not interested, are you? <laughs> I said, no. He said, I, I could kind of tell you weren't. And I said, look, I, I don't know anything about acne. I don't know anything about skin care. All these words you were using, it was like I was in medical school. It was so difficult. He said, well, let me just give you one more thing to think about. He said, there is a product out there called Proactive. He said, they're doing about a third of a billion dollars a year. They're a three-step anti-acne system. They sell for $39.95, and the only thing they have in their system is benzoyl peroxide. Third of a billion dollars. If we could get 10% of that, that's a lot of money. All right, let's give it a try. <laughs> we named our product Lucederm. First fatal flaw. OK? We trademarked it. We did all that stuff. Just know that's not fully proven. Okay, That's not always 100% surety that you're safe. Printed all my packaging, picked up a Walgreens contract. That's a long story. We don't have time for the whole story. Picked up a Walgreens contract. That's a big deal. Walgreens is one of the behemoths out there. Got in Walgreens, you know, Colorado first, then three states, then nationwide. And um, I get a phone call one day. A little company by the name of Pfizer. Probably haven't heard of them. They're so small. And they said, we don't like your name. We have a lotion called Lubriderm. And we think Lucederm is too close to Lubriderm. Yeah, but this is a lotion and this is anti-acne. So let's go to court and fight. You win. When the giant comes, you lose because you're small. So Lubriderm really quickly became Derma Fina. Fine skin. Whoops. That's this little guy right here. So that was our four-step anti-acne system. <sighs> then I got sued by a company called Guthy Ranker. <laughs> they own this one. Well, the front of my package said, treats all five causes of acne. Treats connotes that this is a remedy or a solution. OTCs can't do that, an over-the-counter product. You can't say you're solving a problem. That's a no-no. I didn't know that. I have 25,000 of these. I spent most of my life savings building this company and starting this. And they're suing me over that technicality but they win. I'm on TV running an infomercial as well, and I'm bashing their product. Because benzoyl peroxide is carcinogenic. It's considered to be a carcinogen in other countries, and it's banned. Japan, the UK, 
big name countries. Okay? Well, I'm pointing that out. I never said don't use their product. I said don't use benzoyl peroxide. On the other channel, they're saying benzoyl peroxide, benzoyl peroxide. So they're coming at me with everything they can. So we worked through the night for many, many nights, putting stickers over things. Okay? Unpackaging all of our cartons. Ouch. Two years later, they bought our company. <laughs> Two days later, it was in a dumpster. The big kids get to do what they want. And that's how they keep the playground all to themselves. Who cares? Right? You get paid, who cares? So that was a fun little run. I went and I worked for them for a few years. And my job working for that company was super cool. Because I was the product filter. Everybody wanted Guthy Ranker to carry their product. They wanted to put it on an infomercial and put it on TV. Well, I became the product filter. So I looked at all new products coming into their company. That was about 1,000 products a year. It's a lot of products. And we would pick up about one. Tough job, quite frankly. But as we went through that, there was a formula that I created. Now again, guys, this is, gonna perf this is going to pertain to consumer goods. But this is what I look for in products, OK? If you come to me, if you call me one day and you say, Corbin, you came and spoke at Utah State. I thought you were a total freak. But you seem to have money, so let's talk. <laughs> I'm going to say, tell me about your product. And as you tell me about your product, I'm going to be looking for three things, OK? Number one, is it market, who's it marketed to? Because I'm only interested in one category, and that's women 18 to 65 years old. Any moms in the room? Married with children? OK, since you're not going to report me to the IRS or to some school or something for, yeah. The, oh. <laughs> Married with children? Do you buy for your children? Do you buy for the household? Do you buy for yourself? Do you buy for your husband? <laughs> what she just, if you couldn't hear her, it was yes, 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 yes. Because you know what? It's pretty much true. I told this story earlier. I was headed on a business trip here, I don't know, maybe a year ago. Oh, it was a year ago last fall. And I went to my pocket and I had no cash. My wife's driving me to the airport and I turn and I say, honey, can you spot me some cash? She pulls out her purse and she hands me seven bucks. My check goes direct deposit into the bank account, right? And she hands me seven bucks. I felt like I'd just been given my allowance. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is men don't spend. You bring me a golf club that's going to hit that ball 30 yards further than any other golf club, I have no interest whatsoever. Because marketing to men is so difficult. Marketing to women, it's very easy. There's a science to it. So I won't consider any product that's not marketed to women. Okay? That's just, this isn't school, but this is my, my theory and what I use. Okay? And it happened to be the theory that we used at Guthy Ranker. They're a billion six annual company. Number two, it has to have a continuity aspect to it. Okay? If you come to me to buy this table and that chair, the chances of me seeing you again, not very high. I don't want to sell you a table and a chair. I want to sell you a bottle of weight loss pills, and I want you to be back at my cart 30 days from now. I want to sell you an anti-acne system that you use up in 30 days, and you come back and buy every single month, and the average one of you stays with it for 4.6 years. That's a cash cow. The first time I lost money gaining you as a customer, every purchase thereafter, I only had cost of goods because my marketing expense, I already spent it to acquire you. It's a pretty amazing thing. So, Continuity, huge. Number three, it has to be totally unique. If you call me and you say, I've got this really cool new cell phone. No, that's a bad example. Tire. 
I'm going to say no thanks. But this one diverts the water better than the other one. Who cares? Because you know what? When you're competing in products that are super similar, your margins are this big. It's really tough. So I did my stint with this company, and I came out, did my time with them, and I was working with a couple companies doing consulting. And my phone rang one day. It was a childhood friend. His name's Chris. And Chris said, Corbin, I have the coolest product to show you. You've got to take a look at this. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's a handbag. Seriously? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Really, Chris? A handbag? We don't know anything about handbags. But how are you going to differentiate yourself from the rest of the world in handbags? He said, come on, you've got to see this. I said, all right, come show me. This is going through my mind, and he hits this one right on, and he has a fail here and a fail here. So Chris comes down. I'm in a, in a conference room with a company, and he says, Corbin, it's funny, he talked to me like he's teaching me about women. Women, they like to look nice. Their outfits, they coordinate, and everything has to look nice and tie together, and you know, unlike us men who are just total slobs and, and dress in the dark. If you do, it's totally cool. <laughs> <clears throat> and he says, so the reality is women buy a lot of handbags. They buy them in all these different styles and all these different colors because they want their bag to match their outfit. But taking all their stuff out, I say stuff loosely. The males in the room would call it something else. <laughs> taking all your stuff out, scooping it up, switching it to another bag, the reality is that doesn't happen. You buy a lot of bags, but switching it is such a pain, you don't do it. True or false? Men, don't say anything. <laughs> Women, true or false? OK, I didn't hear one fault in all of that. OK? Because it's a total pain to switch everything around. He says, Corbin, what if, Julie, we, this is a Michi salesperson. This product is called Michi. And this wonderful person works here in Logan selling this product. Chris says, Corbin, what if she could simply take off one exterior and put another one on and go from a blue to a red to a yellow to a cheetah to a black and white? And these, there's your medium, there's your large. Will you show them how those? We have base. Hobo style? Hobo style. Your hand has to stay on the base. Inside, you have your pockets. Everything stays in. You have to do cell phone, credit cards, and actually, it's easier for me when I'm heavy, like mine always. Save stuff. I'm sure it's stuff. <laughs> it couldn't be crap. <laughs> so when I have like this, it's heavy. It's nice. Voila. Voila. Thank you, Miss Julie. <laughs> You're famous. <laughs> Chris walks in and he shows me this. And I'm like, I have never carried a handbag before. <laughs> but that is simply ingenious. Here's your formula for success. If there's a problem and you can come up with the solution, that equals money. OK? You are looking for problems because if there's a problem and you can figure out the solution, you got money. Now, it's not always as tricky as that. Handbag's been around a long time. The fact that you don't change it out, that doesn't necessarily shout to you problem. But now that I lay out that scenario for you, you say, OK, there was a problem there. OK? But that right there, I got to tell you how this all came about. OK? I have never invented any one of these products. And my wife put my bag together for me. There are a bunch of others I would have loved to have shown you, but I never invented anything. I am the guy that believes he can take nothing and turn it into something. I'm a visionary. You come up with this, you bring this to me, and instantly my mind's thinking ahead saying, OK, what can I do? Where can I take this? What am I going to do with this? And I'm building the business plan as you're sitting there pitching to me. Otherwise, I'm not interested, 
and I'm thinking about what I have to do the rest of the day. Okay? But if you pique my interest, that visionary side of me has gone right to work figuring out how that's going to the marketplace. All right? Chris came in with an A in one category and a solid F in two others. You know what happened? He picked up two A's. Because you know what continuity is? Julie selling you a new two of these every single month for $25 to $45 per. And you think women buy a lot of handbags? You ought to see them buy shells. <laughs> As we call those exteriors. It's awesome, isn't it? That's continuity. And is that idea totally unique? Yeah. We have about 32, 34 patents on it. Okay? We've been knocked off dozens of times. All of a sudden, it's Michi that's playing the role of Goliath, squashing the little guys. But that's what you do to protect your brand. It's about business strategy. Okay? So that's a pretty cool concept, and that's how that goes. Let me go back to the early days of this business and tell you something else that is absolutely critical that you're not going to hear anywhere. Frugality. When you start a business and you build your business plan, and you come to me and you pitch it, what I'll be looking for is frugality. Okay? How many companies have you read about that started in their basement or their garage? Companies like Microsoft and on and on goes the list, right? Michi also. We started it in my basement. It stayed in my home to $29 million. 21 employees worked out of my home before we moved into an office building. Yeah. You didn't go run into my laundry room in your undies. Okay? A lot of people. Every room, two to three desks. Family room, no furniture. Desks. Because we started this business in spring of 2007. The economy tanked in the fall. But rather than going out and using our resources to rent buildings, hire lots of people, do all these things, we kept it tight. And you know what? We weathered the worst economic storm any of us have ever known. There's nobody in this room old enough to know a more severe economic storm. My point to you is this, frugality. Cash is king. Somebody gives you $100,000 as an investment into your first business. Your immediate impulse will be to spend that money. Trust me. If I invest in you $100,000, it will be very specifically earmarked where that money is going. I invested in a product about a year and a half ago, $100,000 by coincidence. I'll bet he's still sitting on 50 plus thousand dollars of that money. That's frugality. Those that get the $100,000 and run out and spend it all and don't have the success to talk about from spending the hundred grand and go back to their investor for another hundred thousand dollars, it's going to hurt badly. That's when great big chunks of stock in your company get taken away from you. I can't impress upon you enough as prospective entrepreneurs how important it is to hold on to every penny you can get your greedy little hands on. Don't go spending, guys. You have to be frugal and use that money. Stretch it out to go as far as you can go. You don't know when planes are going to crash into the Twin Towers. It could have happened while we were all sitting in here, heaven forbid. But you see what I'm saying? After that happened, our economy went like this overnight. You never know what's going to happen. Always assume the worst and hold on to cash. Because that's the difference of staying above water and going below. Get it? I'll say it all again one more time if you want. It's that important. Okay? Too often, big companies will come in, they'll give you $100,000, and they'll let you go run your business plan. I think that's fail. To somebody young who's never done it, they run out and they spend that hundred grand just like that. And they come running back for more. Okay? Hang on to it. Cash is king. Any questions to this point? Should have asked that like ten times as we were going. Anybody? Yes, sir. How often do you find uh, someone comes up to you to invest in it? They do that. They run and spend all the money. 
Zero percent. Because I'm an active investor, and so I stay involved and I help people to success. So that's a really important part of the process is you know, being sure that it goes right. And if your business plan is flawed, I'll point those flaws out to you as we, it, things don't happen in an hour, right? It takes a long time. And as we work through all those things, I'll say to you, hey, what's your name? Drew. Drew, here's a problem, and I'd like to see this done differently. The other thing I'll do is I'll look, and you'll have salary built in there. And I'll tell you right away, sorry, none of this money goes towards salary. You go produce sales, and that money you can pay yourself from, but none of this money goes towards salary. Because you need to work to earn your share of the business. You can't just come up with an idea, put together a glossy business plan, and expect somebody else to fund it. They want to see you work your tail off. Okay? And so you might have to work a job and be doing this. And if we do mornings and weekends for the first year, it's cool. That's how you get a business started. There are some exceptions to that, but that's my policy. There was another hand. Yes, sir? You mentioned it being assertive and how key that is, but you also mentioned approval and saying when in your life have you found best to be assertive and use your money? That's an excellent question. When I was speaking about being assertive, your name? Brett. Brett. I was speaking more from the standpoint of personality, not so much with funds. There are times where you really do have to be assertive and you have to go for some things, and I respect that. But one of the biggest mistakes everybody makes is they overpurchase their first inventory shipment. It, the number is like 105% of the time. It happens more than businesses even exist, however that works. I'm exaggerating to illustrate a point. People get too excited and they think it's going to go faster than it does. It's better to tell people, I'm sorry, we're sold out of product. I might be mad, but it also told me, Brett, as the consumer, this guy's got something that's really hot. And when he gets back in, I want it. That's a better scenario than not having any capital because you bought inventory with all of it. Okay? So assertive, it was more being that person that's willing to jump out and ask questions. And one of the places, Brett, where I would illustrate this point the most is you don't have a board of directors. You guys know what a board of directors is? You're probably wrong. What you have in your mind. A board of directors is a people, is a table of people with immense amount of knowledge. Not the same. This guy right here serves the role of, he knows all the mass retailers, he knows the buyers, he knows the CEOs, he's going to get me in any door I want. This next guy, he's the banker. He can get me money when I need money. The next guy, he's a lawyer, and he's going to help me through all these things so that I don't go and do something stupid like put treats all five causes of acne on my box. Okay? These guys are your consultants, they're your advisors. You don't have a board of directors when you start a new company. Okay? Unless it's a gigantic one, well funded. That, that's a very, very exceptional circumstance. So you have, and Dan used this term this, uh, this evening, I loved it, you have a brain trust. You use people like me. You use the people in your business school here to be your brain trust, Brett. And you have to be assertive and go to those people and ask them how to get around hurdles. You have to have them read your business plan, critique you. And if you defend everything they criticize you on, you're making a mistake. It's good to, to fight it out, but that's where I want you to be assertive, is to go build your faux board of directors. Okay? You've got to have that brain trust to help you be successful. Being assertive with money, I, I, I don't even want to go there. I, I, most of those circumstances, I'm going to say, are bad, dangerous. I am the most frugal person on the planet. I'm just cheap. I have held on to my money since I was a very young person. And I believe I'm standing before you today because I'm frugal. I pinched pennies. I held on to everything. And that has opened enough doors for me in life to do whatever I wanted to do. I'm big on frugality. If you work with me in an investment, we will run that business frugally. If you don't have a basement, we will start it in my basement. Maybe my garage. 
But that's how you do it. You hold on to your cash. One other principle that I will share with you that's very important. Everybody wants to run out and lease office space. They want to lease their warehouse space and they want to buy a forklift. No, 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 and no. Maybe there are only three no's. I don't remember. You outsource everything. I learned this at Guthy Ranker. It's a billion six. And it was when I was there. And that's now been seven years, so it could have changed. Uh, and nine years. Billion six. 240 employees producing a billion six. Phenomenal amount of money per employee relation, r ratio. Because they outsource everything. There has, here goes one of my over exaggerations again, okay? There has never been a company in the history of the world that rented the right amount of warehouse space. You always get too much or too little. And you're subleasing because you have too much, or you have those rental containers parked in your parking lot because you have too little, or storage units down the street. Outsource. You can outsource almost everything you do, and outsourcing provides one key word. Scalability. If your business explodes like Michi Bag did, first year, really tough. Second year, explosion. Third year, explosion by magnitudes. If I had purchased or leased on a long lease a warehouse, I'd had some real problems. But you know what? When you outsource to a fulfillment center, they have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of square feet and 50 customers using it, and they provide you scalability. Don't go buy everything. Everybody has this tendency to go spend that money and sign big leases and so forth. Come sign a lease on my basement, okay? Proven breeding ground. It's worked. All right? So that's a biggie is outsourcing. All right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So if uh, buying the warehouse Oh, geez. We don't have time to go through all the mistakes. <laughs> so. Uh, Spence told you I've built and sold seven companies. Um, I have started dozens, dozens of companies. I have so many more failures than I have successes. I'll tell you a fun story, and this is later stage entrepreneurialism. My brother Brett, Brett lived in Saudi Arabia. He was the oil minister's pilot. And he made a lot of money, but it was all stuck in the desert. Not like in the sand, but in the desert bank accounts. And he needed something to do. And I said to him one day, I said, I'll take 250000 You take 250000 We will invest in 10 opportunities at $50,000 a piece. One of them will produce a $50 million company. The second one was Michi Bag. We never even got to the third investment. The first one was called a Fedra 5. Stupid business. <laughs> it was so terrible. You see, we sold a Fedra. Uh, Metabolife was a Fedra, the weight loss product. It was banned. Somebody died, so they banned the product. <laughs> <laughs> Technicalities, right? <laughs> Treats all five causes of acne. <laughs> so anyway, um, no, but I do have an argument there. The amount of people that lost significant amounts of weight and are alive versus, OK, scratch the argument. OK, so where were we before you got me on that tangent? Saudi, OK, so we did this. The first one, the, the first one was a Fedra 5. There is a product, actually, that comes locally that is a legal form of a Fedra but it doesn't give you the buzz that ephedra gives you. Caffeine plus aspirin, that's the answer to weight loss. It suppresses your, your metabolism, fact of the matter. Caffeine plus, caffeine plus aspirin. But because that's not very sexy sales pitch, all your weight loss companies will couple that with something else like green tea and sell it as you know, a green tea weight loss system because everybody can do caffeine plus aspirin. So um, we took this other product and then we put in caffeine to give them their buzz. Well, it didn't work, but we gave it a try. 
So that was the one, and number two was Michi. And Michi's, I don't know, we probably sold $350 million worth of handbags in the past uh, six, six years ago right now. We started that business. Questions? Or lots of hands. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you have to start somewhere. Your name? Jill. Jill. Jill, you have to start somewhere because Walgreens won't give you the time of day. Everybody wants their product in Walgreens, and just getting a buyer to pick up the phone and talk to you, impossible. Getting an appointment, it's easier to get to the moon. So you have to create a story to get their attention. Web sales are a great way. If you can create enough business on the web, people coming and buying your product, um, that's a good start. Okay? Um, but you can also do regional tests. Like with Costco, you can go in and do road shows. Road shows are when you go into a Costco, and they have somebody in there for a 10-day event. It's a weekend, the days between, and the next weekend. You see them, there's a person standing there. If you've ever looked at the sign, it's a special event. And they might be in there selling tents and backpacks in the fall. Um, they're there for a limited period of time. They tend to be pretty flexible with those products. You can be a pretty new product and get in there. And you can do them just in the Utah Costco's. The Utah managers have some say about putting in a product from time to time. <laughs> So that's one way. Internet's another way. Um, carts, Jill. Um, I've started a lot of my business on carts. The carts in the middle of the mall. They're you know, twice the size of this table. A nice little secret for you is a mall cart is an amazing pilot. It's amazing because if Jill takes her product to Walgreens, she sells Walgreens 180,000 units. The only intel that she receives back from Walgreens is a sales report and a return report. You, you have no product feedback. I have started many companies on a mall kiosk cart. And I don't put a minimum wage person there. Because that person's going to be sitting there texting the whole time. They're not even going to know they're in a mall. Okay. I put somebody expensive there, somebody with personality, somebody that's assertive. And they are doing something absolutely amazing for me. As those people come by and they stop to look at the product, they're going to say one of two things, yes or no. If they say no, I'm going to learn why. If they say yes, as we're ringing it up, I'm going to be visiting with them. And they're going to be talking about how cool this is and how great would it be if you came out with a leopard print. You see, I don't get that when I sell through Walgreens. So if you have a brand new idea and it's a consumer good, a cart is a phenomenal opportunity to gain intel that you won't get in any other system. Okay? You ultimately want Walgreens. That's your goal. That's where you want to be is Walgreens, uh, CVS. Those are your two Mac Daddy uh, mass drug stores. And you've, you've written your ticket. You pick up those two guys and it's big business. Walmart being mass and Target, those are really big. Costco and Sam's Clubs, Dynamite Accounts. You get to them when you can take them another success story. So I have a consumer good we're starting right now, that one that I told you about that we invested, where the gentleman's still holding on a year later, fifty-ish thousand dollars of the investment. We're going to Whole Foods. Smaller chain, easier to get into. We're going to test market that just in the Utah Whole Foods. If it's successful, I now have a story to talk about regionally. If that's successful, I get nationally. Now I take my Whole Foods national story to Walgreens, and they're going to pay attention because I have proven success. That's how it works. Somebody that's been through those processes will walk you down that road. Okay? You don't have to know all that. What did we call that? Our brain trust. Okay? Your brain trust will help you through that. All right? Next question. Yes, sir? Total ripoff, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> so he asked about carts, and he said, "You said be frugal, but carts can get really expensive." You're right. Um, 
That's a little more complex. There is a way to do that. Um, look, you go in and you sign a short-term lease, and you know a typical mall cart will start at three or four thousand dollars. By the way, there are A, B, and C malls. We have an A mall in Utah. It's Fashion Place Mall, and by A, I mean it's an A plus. It's one of the top twenty malls in the whole country, and that's where my m biggest metabolite cart was, and it produces. That's where you want to test market your product, not anywhere else. Okay, so. Um, that's one of those necessary expenses. And you just have to be careful that they're going to want a 12-month lease. And you've got to negotiate a three-month lease. That's, you, just, you cannot give them 12 months, because 12 months is going to tie you up and put you at great risk. And that's what they're shooting for. You want to go for three months. And meet somewhere in between much closer to your three than their 12. OK? You got it. Questions? Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, like pushing competition. How do you work on uh, Chinese Can't. Can't. It's one of the biggest problems we face in business. So, um, okay, but this does lead, your name? Sam. Sam. This leads into a really good point, and I will come back to your question. I'm sorry for the answer that I gave you, but it's true. Um, Sam asked about Chinese knockoffs and ripoffs, and it's a way of life in the world, okay? But when you come up with an idea, your first instinct is to be excited and to go share it with somebody. I'll kill you. <laughs> you keep it tight to the vest. Don't share it with your girlfriend. Don't share it with your brother. Don't share it with your neighbor. Don't share it. You have to be really careful with ideas. There are so many millions of stories out there about somebody who came up with a great idea, talked too much, and lost the idea. Because that other person the next morning went and filed. Don't talk. Keep it to yourself. Go talk to your professors, and they'll tell you the right roads to go down. Don't go out there. You've got to go do a few things. Cost a little bit of money, the most important money you'll spend to get that process started and protect you. Don't share your ideas. Big mistake too many people make. If you come to me, you sit down the other side of the table, one of the first things we're going to go through, what have you done on IP? Nothing. Who have you spoken to? If you continue talking after that question, we have a problem. It's too big of a risk for me to invest in you. You get the importance of that? Super important. Don't talk. All right, so the answer to your question, Sam, is one of your patents, and again, I'm in a product world, everybody. I don't know IT and some of these other platforms. But in my world, we'll file a PCT patent. The PCT patent gives me 30 months for my original filing to nationalize in other countries. Okay? So I always do China, and it's totally worthless. You do it anyway so that you have some teeth. Because they're becoming more of a world player, they're being forced to obey some rules and to clamp down on their counterfeiters. But we have counterfeit Michi bags all over the place. We just can't stop it. It's, you can't get to the people. It's everywhere. You go onto Alibaba, you'll find fake Michi bags on all kinds of places. It's gross, but it is what it is. They don't ever make it to the marketplace. A couple big ones did, but they were intentionally coming here. I never see this other garbage come to our market. So you just have to barrel forward and be the first, the most aggressive, to the marketplace and go after it once you see signs of success. It's being too aggressive before you know you're going to be successful that'll sink your ship. Okay? Sorry, not the best answer, but the real answer. One more question. One more question. Yes, sir. Okay, so my favorite book is Good to Great. That's an awesome one. Pulls in that that I specifically applied in Michi. Okay, that was a really cool book for me. But let me share something with you, and I shared this with some groups earlier today. There is a book that's an eighth of an inch thick called Top Grading. Okay, Top Grading tells you as an executive how to hire all your employees and what to do. It'll go through. You can read it in an hour. And it's so interesting, you can't put it down. 
But what it tells you is how to effectively hire people and how much it costs you when you don't do it right. Why do I think you should read that? Because you're all going to be out hiring. Why don't you read what everybody's looking for when they're hiring so that as you're applying and interviewing, you're doing the right thing? It is a phenomenal book that all executives should read. Many do. Mine sits on my desk. And before I go through a big interview process for a CFO or a COO, I'll go through that book. It's really interesting. And it's a very short read. But top grading. Um, those are two of my favorites. I'm going to go back 30 years and say my favorite book of all time is Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Okay, That is just one of the most brilliant books. And a lot of people like to think that um, seven habits to help me. Seven Covey's sep yeah to successful people is the modern version of how to win friends and influence people. I th yeah pretty much. But you know what? At the end of the day, at least in my businesses, it's all about people. And I would rather connect with people and form relationships than just run a business because then I take something away from it and it's meaningful to me. I want to finish on one last point, okay? You guys as entrepreneurs, you're all gonna be super successful. You're gonna go out and you're gonna make millions and millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And you are not going to go buy a Ferrari. And you are not going to go build a 35,000 square foot home. I pledge. <laughs> If you've traveled to another part of our world, you know that we are the most spoiled, rotten people on the planet Earth. I was walking through the streets of Ghana two or three years ago, and here come two Utah State students walking down the street. <laughs> I thought they were Mormon missionaries on P-Day. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you guys doing? We're not in Accra. We are 10 hours out of Accra in a village in the jungle. And they're like, yeah, we're here doing micro loans to help people get their businesses going. Well, they had just, we had just built a middle school in this village for $35,000. That's why we were there. Where we stayed, hotel, no electricity. We had a generator because we were Americans. Our food came from Costco in somebody's suitcase, not, I mean, literally, the people that took us. We had Kirkland food. We had syrup, M uh, Mrs. Butterworth syrup for breakfast. Um, it was really strange. But my point is this. You look at how we live, and the disparity isn't this. It's this. And when you do make it and you become successful, you have a responsibility to give back and help. Let me tell you one other thing along those lines. There is a giving component to your business that is really important. We took one of our shells, and we called it our hope shell. We have 30 to 25 to 30 of these exteriors at any given time in four different sizes. Every one of them has one called the hope shell. Okay, So this one shell has all decorated with hope and cancer awareness stuff. We donate our profits from the cell of this shell every time to cancer research. Huntsman Cancer Institute. To date, that's three and a half million dollars. Now here's the important thing. I started this business in February, March 2007. My dad passed away from pancreatic cancer in January of 2007. We get this business going and I say right away, I want to do something for cancer. I want to give back. Time goes on. This is what it developed into was a hope project. I did it because I lost my dad. It was tender for me, and I wanted to give back. You know what happened? Through the hope program, people saw that this company had heart. And they wanted to be a part of a company with heart. And our business exploded. Everywhere I go around the country speaking, every single time somebody comes up to me and says, I joined your company because of hope. Every single time. That's not why I did it. Please don't do it. 
for the selfish gain of your business. Do it because you do have heart and you want to do some good with your success and you will benefit from it. But don't do it for that reason, but keep that in mind. All right, I think we're way over on time. I hope you gained a nugget from this. Good luck to you and your new businesses, everyone. <laughs>